I want to thank you for coming and talking with me. Thank you for having me. Excited yeah. to crash your party. Yeah, no, I've been I've been a fan of yours for a while now. Uh, as you know, we're turned into this thing by the that movie, by the movie, right? Who killed the the electric car? Uh, Not and me. So I didn't. You you don't because you're you're. I mean, you were I part of that it. thing. <laughs> Exactly. Now you didn't kill it, but we, yeah, yeah that is a it's such a pivotal point in our journeys. I think as uh, I don't know what are we. Uh, I think I'm like kind of like a evangelist. Uh, I don't know. Like it's hard to pinpoint what I do, but I basically preach EVs all day. Uh, you know, on my channel, and so many people have bought EVs because of me. Uh, some Teslas. Even though I, I haven't bought Tesla till recently. So, but it's a crazy thing. And it all kind of started watching that movie. Um, you know, while doing research and stuff, I came up with that. I came, you know, by that movie and uh, you were part of that. So why don't you tell us how that journey started for you? Because you go well I'm before old. that. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, you, I mean, I would say that you're, you're responsible uh, for, you have play a part in, and being responsible for the modern um, production electric car, right? Because cars have been around forever, but the modern production electric car started at one point, and and you played a, a role in that, right? So very small one, yes, yeah. Certainly, electric cars have been around for a hundred years, and I mean, we all sort of know some of that history. But the EV one was considered, and still is considered, sort of the first modern electric car. Yes. And it was actually announced in January of 1990 at the LA Auto Show. It was just a concept car at the time. But California had already had, the Air Resources Board was established, the Clean Air Act was already years along, and California had really terrible smog problems. And here yeah. there's this car company showing a non-polluting, at the tailpipe at least, electric car. And CARB kind of went, oh my God, this is very, very cool. And then a few months later on Earth Day, the cha then chairman of General Motors announced that they were gonna actually put it into production. And then CARB got very excited and said, well, gosh, if you guys can do it, then there's no reason your competitors can't. And GM ironically inspired <laughs> the zero emission vehicle mandate that followed, that ended <laughs> up being passed in 1990, didn't take effect till 1998 really. And in the meantime, GM launched the EV1 at the end of 1996. Nice. And so I had been, I, I started out at the age of 17 selling Saturns in a showroom to put myself through college. <laughs> I graduated a little early. I was highly self-sufficient, still am, wanted a way to pay, pay for my studies. And so I thought, figured I'd sell cars and lots of downtime for homework and pretty decent money at that age. And so I was in the Saturn side of the business and a few years in EV1 started to come along. And while it started to be a Cadillac, ultimately GM decided to give the EV1 to Saturn because the demographic, the buyers were Cadillac buyers. It was middle-aged white guys with money, <laughs> yeah. but Saturn was really known for great customer service, introducing new product and new ideas to the public, things like that. And so they kind of figured hmm, Saturn and all their touchy feely community stuff will actually be better at this. And so I moved over after a few years of selling cars into the EV1 program, drove one for the first time on the back roads of Tennessee, decided I liked torque more than anyone rightfully should. <laughs> yes. I, I was initially gravitated to, uh, initially drawn to it because of, of geek, you know, efficiency and things like that, engineering. But it turns out I am a car person when there's torque involved more than I ever was before. So I yes. fell in love and, and basically never left. And that program continued for several years. And it was fits and starts and, you know, sometimes GM was very into it and sometimes they weren't, but ultimately they decided that they were going to end that program. And the rest of the auto manufacturers at the time did too. It was the big six, Honda, Toyota, Nissan, GM, Ford, and Chrysler were the ones that were participating. There were more actual pickup trucks and SUVs that were electric back then than since. And so we've been kind of coming full circle towards those bigger vehicles again. And all of them banded together to sue the state of California and get rid of that mandate. 
And ultimately, you know, we started trying to save different cars when they were getting ready to crush them, things like that. And so a group of activists had gone after Ford because a few of them had bought their pickup trucks and they did this successful campaign of trying to save the ones that were left, those that, that wanted to buy them should be allowed to, and they were successful. And we kind of had this debate, you know, well, who next? <laughs> and at the time it was going to be Toyota, but we knew of these little 78 cars in Burbank, these EV1s that were left and would be crushed soon, but we're sort of the last remaining visual, visual of, of that car. And so we ended up setting up this 24 seven vigil for a month, <laughs> trying to save these cars. I mean, it was a total stunt to get the story stunt. told. <laughs> we're just out there on the sidewalk, these dorky little EV people in our umbrellas because it was rainy February. And uh, two weeks into it, the first newspaper kind of finally caught on and we ended up getting some press and GM got very frustrated along the way. They kind of went, okay, fine. We thought we'd wait them out, but these guys are stubborn. They're not leaving. What do we do? And the, ultimately they sent tow trucks and a couple of us chased them to the <laughs> desert. We followed them. I have now been detained for stalking. <laughs> for stalking? Because people. I am very threatening. Let me tell you. <laughs> yes. So yes, me and my little Saturn followed us uh, an 18 wheeler to, to Arizona and full of EV1s. So yes, we had some adventures along the way and Chris Payne, who had been one of my EV1 drivers, had a camera and sort of had been playing with the notion of making a film. We'd held the funeral for the car by then. Our current mayor of Los Angeles gave a eulogy to it. Wow. <laughs> sort of interesting when he decides to run for president one day and someone digs that out. Uh, but we thought we'd just try to tell the story. And so that's how that started. It was five years of running around Chris and his camera and just trying to piece it together on the premise of, even if you think we're the crazy ones, someone will be interested in the story. And PBS Frontline hasn't shown up, stuff like that. So he decided he'd just do it himself. And luckily a few of the other EV1 drivers were fairly well connected. Dean Devlin um, ended up getting it uh, to Sony Pictures. And so they ended up buying it and then it got into Sundance. And we all showed up this excited little pilgrimage of people <laughs> to watch it for the first time. My husband's sitting next to me going, oh my God, your head is so big. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and he's in it too, but I, somehow he likes making fun of me for it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was very, very powerful film. Uh, yeah, you guys did a good job uh, telling that story because... Yeah, I think it, it moved a lot of us, right? Going like, what the hell happened here, you know? Um, and definitely you were, so you you were pinpointed out of the the group of activists because you were like an insider right. person, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, Hi, here's this former employee that's out on the front lines <laughs> with a picket sign. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> wow, it's not just crazy at this point. It's like, oh, people even within cells, you know, they're, uh, they're having trouble with this. Um, did you know, obviously, you, you know that um, Francis Ford Coppola had one also. Yes, yeah. And he just made it disappear. He was like, I'm not giving back or something, right? He did Yeah, no, that's lore. <laughs> well, I mean, he said that. Uh, in Jay I know. Leno. Oh, no, oh okay. no, I know. Toward the end of the program, about 40 or so were gutted and donated to museums and universities. His car collection is technically a 501c3. It's oh. a museum. Okay, okay. And so he got to keep his. It was dismantled like the others. Ah, and that okay. it was officially donated it's under that It's a non-runner. Oh, yes. he didn't say that. Yeah. And so there have there are a few that have been since made running in some form. I, I know for sure that for a while he was wanting to do that because I was contacted to help. Okay. Um, so I don't know if he ultimately succeeded or not. There are four or five uh, universities that have rebuilt theirs Good into job. various running conditions. Including the one that we all see the picture of the dusty one yes right? that uh, one has somewhere. not been rebuilt but okay. yes that one needs a better home <laughs> yes yeah and and it keeps popping up every once in a while right I like know. every couple <laughs> of years it resurfaces with a thicker layer of dust <laughs> they're like come on who's gonna save this one <laughs> i know well and, and i very much want to relocate it uh, and occasionally i get a little bit of of promise within general motors of receptiveness to that notion i think there could be a very cool community oriented project there but yeah. at, not surprisingly they also have special feelings <laughs> about that car yeah so it vacillates towards like oh that could be kind of cool to oh my god can we please stop hearing about the ev1 yes so they yeah there's a little sore about that right because they i mean obviously there's a movie that went kind of viral it went crazy right 
Uh, I mean, a lot of people have seen that movie, right? Yeah. It's it's a very well. Uh, yeah, I'm surprised how many people are still finding it. I get yeah. a couple notes a week still, which is lovely. It's it's now 14 years old. Yes, it's very well done. I mean, you know, I Chris did a great job. Yes, was yeah. was he a professional uh, filmmaker or was this? this, this he he made a movie. few things before. Um, it was it, one of his first bigger projects. Um, okay. Dean Devlin, our executive producer, is known for small things like Independence Day and Godzilla and The Patriot and Leverage. <laughs> okay, okay. So, um, it's a real so we had a little film experience on our side. <laughs> okay. It was a great film. I mean, it had everything. And it had the story. It had the the struggle, right? It had the, the, the bad guy. <laughs> yeah, well, it had seven. We had seven suspects it was a murder mystery <laughs> yes and yeah definitely i could see where gm would still be sore about that because obviously and i've i kind of seen stuff where you have you kind of stick up for them after a while you're like listen right you, you're kind of sort of that phone now that they're like come on just let them be now they're doing other cars like let's yeah let's i mean i i have bury the hatchet here yeah, and I mean, it's funny to watch, um, you know, Volkswagen and Dieselgate is sort of a similar paradigm. Yeah. But my my premise on EV1 is it's now a 20-year-old decision. And yeah. the people involved, generally speaking, except for a few engineers who, the engineers have always been on our side. The engineers have always loved these technologies like we do. So yeah. the executives that made Executive. those decisions are not the executives now. They're gone. Yeah. Even the, so, the CEO, you know, right? Wasn't it the, the CEO at that time was... Uh... Well, it was Jack Smith. Well, there are several. Okay. <laughs> but Jack Smith was the CEO when the initial death started to happen. Okay. Um, Roger Smith was the one that announced it in the first place, and there were a few more in between and after. But, oh, but yeah, and so generally speaking, the folks that were involved are no longer there. And regardless of what I or you or anybody else thinks of that choice back then judge them for the things they do now. I completely yeah. understand the people that say to me, you know, I hate the fact that they sided with the EPA and the Trump administration over the Air Resources Board, and therefore I don't feel good buying a GM car. Fine, whether or not I agree with your reasoning, at least it's a fairly current <laughs> bit of reasoning. It's the yeah. folks that go, this one thing that happened 20 years ago, I'm gonna boycott them forever. Yeah. I don't think boycotts are all that advisable to begin with, because if you tell a company, I will never, ever buy what you make, no matter what you do, what yeah. is their incentive to make yeah. something better? Yeah. It's like, <laughs> okay. Well. The, yeah. In the case of all, like all, Nissan, Toyota, Honda, they all crush their cars too. It's not like GM was the only one. It just was the most popular car in that group and it got the most attention, but yeah. their behavior was not that much different except for their their veneer was nobody really wanted them. Whereas yeah. Honda kind of said, we're doing this because we have to, some law says we have to, and when, we, when we're done, we're done. We're not going to pretend otherwise. And so, yes, there was a difference in the storytelling around it, and the, it was the cover-up. It's always, it's not the cover-up. It's always the cover-up, cover yeah. That's what, what hurt GM in the end, was the cover-up. Yeah. But otherwise, it's all basically the same thing, but it's also old news. And I yeah. get on GM just the same of you guys got to figure out how to talk about this program in a way that is not so defensive and shameful. <laughs> you guys engineered this really cool car that had a lot of really leading features that every other EV is using now. You deserve to have some pride in that. Your business decisions at the time weren't the greatest, but that doesn't change the fact that you engineered a really cool car that people were willing to get arrested for. And yeah. 20 years later, people show up on my Facebook feed chiming in about how much they love their car. Even to the president of GM, who to his credit also chimes in now and then and wishes we'd all get over it. So <laughs> yes. there's a balance there of talking the about it with respect that's not the same as rehashing. Yeah. Well, I I think they missed the point that it, this car uh, meant so much for a lot of people, right? It meant change. It meant like uh, fixing a real issue problem, right? Like uh, looking into the future kind of thing. And so you, it's not just the car. I mean, it stands for a symbol. And that's why I guess but people it, can't but think it. But it was the car in some ways. And it was cool. Like yeah. cars are an emotional purchase. Yeah. And this was no different. Yes, yeah. it was a nerdier car, and sure, fine, it was Enviro, but that's not why anyone ever has bought electric cars. Environmentalism has been the least of it. It was yeah. cool. It was Well, fast. I don't know. I'd say maybe uh, Priuses. There were the 
they were the cool car to have because you were the we woke, buy emotionally the we justify rationally <laughs> yeah yes. sure so the wokeness is the emotional component yes and we justify it with all this rationalism around you know i feel smart and i save money and whatever but it's really i want yeah. to be seen as cool environmental but yes. that's not really why i bought the car and the same yeah. thing is true for all of the evs then and since and the part that a few people within GM recognize, but not pervasively enough, is that what they really lost was the community passion. Yeah. EV1 drivers were Tesla drivers before there were Teslas. Yeah. They were just as passionate, would show up at the regulatory meetings. If a, they had a problem with their car on the freeway, they would limp off the highway before they'd call a tow truck because they didn't want the public to see an image of an EV1 on a tow truck. They formed clubs. They went in and taught dealers how to be better. All sorts of various things that we, we see Tesla drivers today doing exactly the same thing. Yeah. And it's assumed that Tesla originated that. But there's a fair amount of it that is a fundamental EV thing because EV drivers of all stripes believe that they're helping to co-create the success of the technology, whether it's a Fiat or a Tesla or a Nissan Leaf. But there's an additional layer that is brand specific and Tesla gets credit for that. But all of these things are stuff that GM once had in its stable yeah. and completely let it dissipate. Yeah, they didn't and value it. They just yeah. destroyed and it. And to some degree, to their credit, they rebuilt a fair amount of it in the run up to Volt. And then yeah. ever since Volt launched, they've kind of just let all of that go. Yeah. You know, I was one of those, right? Like, I, I mean, I was a Tesla, a Tesloid, I guess, at the beginning, but I just couldn't afford one. And so I had to make my own. I made my bus, yeah. right? And right. so then uh, I kind of like, then after a while, I was like, well, we got to get one of these cars that I got to figure out a way to, like, this is kind of like an experiment, right? I drive it. It's about the world's most dangerous car. <laughs> and I drive it. I'm fine because I don't drive much. But I'm like, for my wife, I want something that's safe, something that's modern, something that's got airbags and stuff, right? And so I was one of these people that never would never buy any American cars. I never, I thought of myself as never, ever again, well, actually ever, buying an American car because they were all trash in the 90s, in the, you know, late 80s or whatever. And so I was, I was a Toyota guy. I, was, I owned yeah. several Toyotas and stuff. But then when the when Chevy came out with the Volt, right, which was the the, the hybrid one, um, we went to the auto show and we saw it, and I'm like, "Well, this is amazing! Yeah, because this is an amazing car. Like, you could drive it electric, or you could just forget to charge it and just put some gas in it, and it's seamless, and you can go anywhere, and it looks nice, and it's kind of you know fancy inside." I'm like, "I'm sold." Yeah. I'm like, I don't care that they killed the, the electric car. I'm like, right. I'm buying one. Yeah, and I had to. I, I actually didn't buy it because I thought the system was so, you know, I was looking at it from my engineering side, and I thought, this is so complex. I can't even explain how the system works. It's bound to probably be kind of unreliable. So I'm not going to buy this car. I'll just lease it. And so I leased two of them. And they were the greatest cars ever. Yeah. Never gave us any trouble. And they just went. And they they're were... still one of the best, if someone was looking for a used car, still mm -hmm. one of the best, most solid options you could come across in the EV world, plug-in world. Yeah. Yeah. And, and 10 years later, still the most electrified plug-in hybrid ever built. I mean, it's, it's one of those cars that everyone kind of looked at it and went, oh my God, that's a Chevy. Yeah. And some people gave them crap for not doing an EV out of the gate. Um, yeah. And part of the reason I did give them credit and still give them credit is Who Killed came out in June of 20, 2006. And we were doing the press tour when somebody, a reporter called us up when we were in, in uh, Minneapolis and said, what do you think about the fact that GM's doing another electric car? And I basically told this poor woman she needed to lay off the crack. <laughs> it's like, there's no way. Wow. But they, a few months later, they announced a plug-in hybrid Saturn at the LA Auto Show. And then they watched the press all call us for comment. What do you think about that? And they went, oh my God, you know, we're, we're not going to get rid of these people in their little movie. And so they called us up and said, if you think that was cool, we have this thing come into Detroit in January that you want to know about. So you should come to that auto show. 
And we kind of went, yeah, no, we don't trust you. We're not showing up on your word. And so they actually flew us, Chris Payne and I, the director, flew us out to Washington, D.C. And we met at like a McCormick and Schmicks or something, some smoky room, but like the proverbial D.C. corner smoky room. It was one of those kind of settings of like eight VPs around a table and Chris and I on a laptop. And they showed us the vault for the first time the month before the auto show and said, no, really, we're serious. You should come to this show. <laughs> and wow. so we did. And we're like, well, we're not making another movie, but we'll bring a camera just in case. And that became the first shoot for the second movie. For the second movie. Yeah. yeah. And, and for months it was like, uh, we're, we're not going to do another one, but we'll just track a few things because why not not get yourself into a corner. And that became the start of the second one. But, you know, it was a half dozen months after they had just gotten killed in this movie. Yeah. <laughs> and they were the first of the fray back in with something with a plug. And it wasn't a pure EV, but it was really respectable range yeah. for a plug-in hybrid. And it I, was it was the perfect was, transitional vehicle. It was There's, good. And yeah. I kind of got it on, the, on with that timing. They had they considered a, a, a pure EV, but I also understand that if they had done a pure EV at that time and it went well, then it would have been C, all the more evidence you shouldn't have killed the EV one. And if they did a pure EV and it didn't go well, then it would have been you killed a second car. Yeah. So there was kind of no winning for GM at the time, in my opinion, with a pure EV. Well, and, and there so was no infrastructure, no now. fast charging. So then it would it would have been set for failure because you know, you couldn't put more than 150 miles of range in that car, right? Uh, At the I mean, time, that would have been, I mean, the EV1 ended on 150 to 70 miles of range. So, yeah. any, I mean, it was funny to watch Leaf and everything else launch years later with half the range that we yeah. had in Gen 2 EV1. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, they would have been roughly the same and it would have been all of those criticisms. And with, I mean, the, the biggest challenge to all of these companies is that most the incumbents, most of them don't believe in this yet. They yeah. don't believe they can be successful. They don't necessarily know how, even those that want to are really uncomfy with it. And so even if they were willing at the time to put themselves out there to have done so without a product they were comfy with in a way they were willing to market it and support it robustly would have been a disaster. And even Volt, they, they started way too arrogant. They launched this thing and, and I had GM people yelling at me from across the auto show floor of like, you're gonna love this thing. It was like, mm, yeah, Maybe. no, I don't trust you yet. <laughs> and they learned really quickly that we all just sort of went, you're gonna have to prove this. And they spent a couple of years, it, it became a joke of like when they would polish a door handle, they'd put out a press release. <laughs> but that's kind of <laughs> what it took at the time to convince the world they were well, serious and again. Did you get to see the actual production version or was it the prototype one? The, well, that the was the concept spacey, originally. The concept, which, okay. Which I liked better. Yeah, it would look like a cool car, right? <laughs> It was a cool car. Yeah, that was the first one. And then, it, of course, it evolved. But in that time since, they had to evolve their approach as well. And so they ended up, to their credit, doing a lot of very deep engagement with a lot of the advocates and community members and, and goofy things. Like, eventually, they'd call me up and go, OK, we're coming out to the TED conference when it was still in Long Beach. We're going to have two volts. Call up 10 of your, you pick them. You call up 10 to 15 of your, your buddies, your EV people. You, you bring them. And so I would, and I would always include a few, like I will never buy a GM car again, guys, and you know, former EV1 drivers and folks, yeah. and just like, I'm not gonna serve this up on a platter. You can engage sincerely with the mix. And they did really well with that because the, the drivers kind of went, oh yeah, no, I love talking to the engineers. And what I saw there was that's not the GM that killed my EV1, that's the GM that built it in the first place. Yeah. And it's stuff that people like me have known all along. The, the, the market we're in, we're still early adopter, the market we're in wants to know the faces and the people behind the brand. It's yeah. not just, I drive a Tesla, it's Elon, it's JB, it's George Blankenship, yes. it depends on your era of Tesla. And the same yeah. thing is true for GM and the others. It's not just GM, it was Tony Pazawatz or whatever the case may be. And the more they could humanize themselves, the better it went. In the so, more recent years, it's been less human. And yeah, I think well, that's I mean, as it scales up, right? I, rightly so. Um, was So GM obviously saw the value of that, and that's why they let you guys shoot that second movie, right? Because, well, I mean... Everyone wanted to be in our second one, yeah, our first yeah. one. <laughs> so okay. much. Yeah, exactly, because now you guys got... Uh, you guys have access now. And by the way, who, if you're watching this, you haven't seen... 
Who Killed Electric Car. You guys need to go see Who Killed Electric Car. It's probably on Netflix, right? Or somewhere. Yeah, it's, it's, probably it's always everywhere. on Netflix, Prime, Vimeo, and they're all always on YouTube. And, and then the YouTube. second sequel is... Uh, Revenge of the Electric Car. Revenge of the Electric Car. And then that one, you guys have full access. You guys go behind doors at the, this development of these other cars. And not just them, but two big manufacturers right it's nissan yeah. it was and nissan gm and tesla GMs. so and they're tesla very, and even an independent one yes which yeah, is they're, you know they're these... very different movies yeah well no independent uh um car maker builder a diy yeah guy. gadget yeah gadget right which i i you know i that's that's my guy because i'm i'm him essentially you know i'm i'm a diy guy I couldn't afford these cars. I'm like, this is for rich people. I'm going to build my own, you know, kind of thing. Ended up spending about the same amount of money. <laughs> and yes. I, it took me about the same amount that I would have, I, I, you know, had to wait to get a Tesla. But I learned quite a bit, and I became an activist uh, as a result of that. So I'm like, oh, it's, it's probably the better route that I took. Um, so that movie was it's great because, yeah, you have access. You get to go behind doors. Uh, you get to see the development of this this car now. The right. which car was it? The the Chevy one. Well, so the yeah the revenge ended up sort of following the attempts of GM, uh, Nissan, and Tesla to, and Gadget to and Gadget. bring electric cars back to the road. And so it was the Chevy Volt, the Tesla Volt. Roadster. It wasn't even Model S yet. The Roadster and Nissan Leaf. And the Nissan Leaf. And so yes. yeah, and and it, <laughs> in part. The hardest bit of footage in Who Killed the Electric Car to get and keep was a little cameo at the end of that first movie of the Tesla Roadster driving around. And weirdly, and I had really I that early know, on. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was that early that on. Was and, not, okay. Yeah, and I'd gotten to know Tesla actually while we were still doing the the EV1 vigil. So I left that vigil for a day in March of 2005 and flew up to to. The Bay Area to visit Martin and Mark Eberhard, the Martin. founders of Tesla. Yes, okay. And so, and of course, you know, we sparred from the start, which made us friends since. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> at least for quite some time. And so that's when we got to know them, and that's when we started to think about putting them in the film. But we, along the way, in order to convince them, about five or six of our crew members actually ended up having to order Tesla Roadsters. Oh, wow. So a couple of our producers, a couple of our executive producers. They're like, we don't feel you're right. Uh, yeah. You're, and, you, you and feel somehow you're... when we bought a bunch of their cars, they felt better about okay. it. Okay. Um, and then for that bit of footage in Who Killed, our producers actually went out and the shot strike the strike is in a house, them. right? Yeah. It's like in someone's house or something. Well, well, no, I mean, that second one was in the in the shop, but the first one is just sort of the rolling hills, like driving around kind of footage. Okay. And so they went out and they produced that for them. They took the bit for the film and then they gave the rest to Tesla to use in their showrooms. So in the early years of their showrooms, all that footage of those cars driving around were actually shot and produced by the Who Killed folks. Oh, <laughs> okay. That's cool. <laughs> Yeah, and then there was a bit of time through the festival season. They wanted us to take it out and then put it back in for theatrical release. It was it was bizarre, but it was the hardest we worked for four seconds of anything in that first film. But having bought all those cars and things, we had really great access for for the second film. And then both um, GM was certainly more receptive to the to the next one. And Nissan came about because I ended up at a conference in England in sort of 2009 or so and ran into the in a green room the number two guy at nissan who most recently ran aston martin andy palmer and he hadn't seen our first film at all so he was interested in the topic and i said we're making another movie and he hadn't seen the first one yet so he wasn't yet biased we'd really love to have nissan in it oh. and he ended up getting nissan and carlos gone <laughs> to be willing to be in the yeah. second one well they were making a huge investment in this program yeah. so they were like well let's a movie is a great advert, you know, right. advertising for for a program like that, right? And so yeah. they were smart enough to do it. And they were super supportive. They sponsored lots of showings, and I mean, I mean, why not? Because there were everybody was a hero in the second second film, so there were yes. no downsides there. Yeah, yeah, it definitely showed. Uh, you know, it's funny because you get to see the Chevy CEO. It was uh, what's his name? Um, Bob Lutz. Bob Lutz. Which, uh, it's loved by car people, right? I mean, this guy is iconic when it comes to yes. car culture, right? And you see him going through the struggles of trying to run 
uh, you know, General Motors, right? And and then trying to come up with this new concept, the car, and doubting themselves. There's great footage there. There's a lot of great dialogue in between them, back and forth. Yeah, you get you get to see like what what it what it takes to run a big company. You know, yeah. The, yeah. Well, the best parts were the premiere nights at the Tribeca Film Festival, when each of those big shots saw the film for the first time, the first sitting time. next to each other. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then each hearing what the other said about them for the first time. Oh, that's right, because they were on their own. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Was there any of them that were, like, raising their eyebrows or... A little bit, but it, at least it was a dark theater. But yeah, it was very funny. As as someone like in the row behind them, it was very fun to watch. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. These are the big, I mean, these are big people now that you guys were covering uh, in their efforts, right? To to, yeah. to to bring the electric car back in on, you know? And I think they did great. I mean, I love, you know, obviously I love that last scene where Gadget drives his little Porsche Yes. Down to, I mean, that was so iconic. It's, it's, it's a great scene because that's the, that's the dream. That's what I, this we all dream about. It's like, oh, we convert our own car. It's our own classic car. It's, there's a huge market. I mean, it's not huge, but it's a big market in California. Right. Uh, there are businesses that, you know, sprung up from that and stuff. And uh, it's electrifying their own classic cars. And he, you guys visualized it perfect. You know, it's like driving to the desert charging and then you know going into that little motel with the extension I, that was perfect yes that is yeah that was as perfect as you can to get it yeah well and it's endemic of the of the ev movement anyway which you know the electric auto association was sort of the original advocacy evangelist group and it's been around since like the 1960s and it, there's you know 60 or 70 chapters around the country and generally yes. speaking they have always been these grassroots converters to the point that when EV1 and that generation came out, they looked down their noses at everybody who got one of like, really, you just bought one? I made mine myself. Store bought and one? Yeah. Totally that elitism going on, which was very yeah. funny. But this has always been, it's the, it's the single example in the history of the automotive space that has been so community led and so grassroots led. It is the only example where the industry has required demand to predate and continually exceed supply. We've yeah. been hearing executives for years going, when we see demand for electric cars, then we'll think about building them. Yeah. With every other automotive product and frankly, all retail product on the planet, the model is we build something and then convince you that you want it. That you need it that you <laughs> That's want. what happened with SUVs or yeah. hybrids or even hydrogen. There's no pre-existing market that goes, give me a hydrogen car. It is the automakers going, yeah, we think that this is the path forward and some need. political shenanigans involved <laughs> about electric yeah. cars. But that's the model is we, we think we know better than you do what you want. EVs are the only case in which that's been opposite. Well, why do you think that is? So my, so my theory, obviously not knowing how car make, the, the whole inner workings of car manufacturers and stuff, right? But I'm like, there's a partnership that goes back 100 years with the, with the oil industry. You can't just turn their back like that. Like, you know, okay, yeah, good run. We had a good run 100 years. We're, now we're making electric cars. Like, that, that's, a, that's a thing that it's preventing them from wanting to make electric cars, right? Am I right? Or is that just oversimplification of a much broader, much complex problem? I understand the inclination and... And certainly we can't discount the things that happen, you know, among friends on golf courses. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I think that aspect is overblown. I is think it? from the automotive industry perspective, it's less my oil company friends will be annoyed with me. I think it's more, this is the entrenched model. This is what we're used to. This is what we're good at. My yeah. bonus is not premised on building the future. It is premised on what I sell this quarter. It's, yes. it's things like that. I think we... I think in some ways we give too much credit to the notion of conspiracy because uh, I it's, I mean, that's it's a more symbiotic relationship than generally happens. I think it is much more basic and human and humans are afraid of change and they're yeah. worried about making rent this month and they're worried about their retirement plans and they're not yeah. thinking so hard about this whole other company on the other side of the world. But, you know, dealers would have more of an influence at this point than an oil company. 
and they have their own entrenched issues. And ah. so there's layers to all of this. That yeah, and, the, and their business module is on making money on, on service. And so therefore, if you're like, wait a minute, EVs have less service? Oh, we don't want that. Like, let's not push the EVs. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a, it's an interesting point. It's one we made in, in, in Who Killed the Electric Car. And in fact, I said my husband in it. He's the technician that's sitting there at the end of that film showing all the parts that EVs don't use. So my family was deeply involved in making that particular point. It also gets a little too emphasized, I think. In 25 years of working on this, I have yet to meet a dealer that is sincerely concerned about that. The vast majority of them sort of go, you know what, I'm going to be retired by the time this takes <laughs> off enough to affect my service revenue. Okay. So and maybe my kid will own the place, but meh. I mean, what feels very fast to us is actually still pretty slow in the automotive world. And all of these cars are coming with significant warranties on them. So I, I've known dealers that stayed afloat for an extra couple of years on warranty dollars from their EV programs because any new car, any new program will have infant things that happen. And when those things happen under warranty, that's nice revenue for the store. So I have not encountered this whole, you know, we'll, we, we're gonna lose our shirt on service thing. There is a fair conversation around how to replace some of that revenue in the long term and how to pivot with different services. Certainly, you know, oil changes are no longer needed, stuff like that. I know stores that sell a decent number of EVs who put an electrician on staff to help put chargers in homes and things like that. So yeah, there's an opportunity to have a more creative conversation, but I think we get too shrill about the service when a lot of it is the same thing. It is more human. People are not going to be great at selling something they're uncomfortable with. Generally mm. speaking, the training that OEMs provide to dealers sucks. It's yeah. short, it's superficial. <laughs> it doesn't equip them to be comfy with the thing they're trying to sell you. And therefore, why would they? It doesn't matter what it runs on. And, and we've seen similar issues with other technologies and cars anymore because the screens and things are advanced enough that you kind of really need to understand them in order to be good at demonstrating them. Most people selling EVs have never had a test drive longer than the one they're offering you. They can't tell you what it's like to take one home and plug it in because they've never done it and yeah. so on and so forth. So a lot of this stuff is the proverbial not rocket science, <laughs> but it requires thought and not assuming that all dealers are assholes, <laughs> things like that. And in some cases there is a revenue aspect. People will make less money selling electric cars. There are ways to handle that. People in some cases make less money servicing electric cars. There are ways to handle that. All of these things are things that we have seen since EV1 and in many cases have learned how to deal with them, but it requires learning those lessons from the past and being open to the conversation. And I see so much defensiveness about the Tesla model, but Saturn had corporate owned stores too. There is nothing about the fact that Elon signs those checks that keeps any other brand from providing the same kind of retail experience that Tesla does. Its entire secret sauce is really well-trained salespeople who are passionate about their product in a low-pressure sales environment. Yeah. That's basically it. <laughs> There's yeah. not much more to the Tesla sales model than that. Anybody could offer that. And some individual dealers do. And there are individual dealer chains that we can point to. But across the board, there is zero excuse for how bad the EV buying experience is in most <laughs> other brands <laughs> Yes. versus Tesla. Full yeah. Stop. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, I had a terrible buying experience at my Chevy's. <laughs> you know, you know, yeah. I don't know if you remember those cars. They were really great uh electric, but then as soon as they you had to run them on gas around the city on takeoff and startup, they were kind of terrible cuz the the engine wasn't connected to yeah, the Yeah, the power wheels. band thing was weird. <laughs> yes. You, the you, initial transition was pretty seamless, but those power yeah. bands in Gen 1 was not, not You would ideal. pull up to a, a red light and the engine was idling really high. Yeah. And then the light would turn green and then the engine turn off and, and then you would go, right? As you're like, what is going on here? So both times I took test drives and the cars were completely dead because they were in charge. Because they don't know what the car did. The guy was like, oh, I had an electric one? I think we have one over there in the back. You know, it's like they bring it out and of course it does not charge. And so they, yeah. that's how they gave me the thing. And obviously I knew everything about the car. 
he knew nothing about the car most of the times. So I was like, okay, just let's not talk. Let's just drive it. And it was mostly because my wife was going to buy it and, you know, she was going to drive it. So I wanted her to get a feel right. for it before we signed the papers. Uh, but we knew we were there to buy that one and we were going to get it, whether the guy knew it or cared right. about it or not. Um, but yeah, I'm like, oh, yeah, I could see where people are actually genuinely trying to shop. <sighs> they would do terrible here. Yeah. yeah but, they, and it's still the case, even 10 years in, where generally speaking, people already know what they want before they walk in. And that has helped to circumvent some of the attempt to cross sell you into something else. And it's really yeah. fun when somebody looks like me walks in because, you know, girl, what do we know about any of this? And so yeah. the number of times I've walked into a dealer to test drive something that's an EV and been told, no, 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 you really want the gas version. Which yeah. my husband always enjoys when that happens, especially to a <laughs> former car salesman. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it goes so well. Um, yeah. So you have to be really staunch on what you want and what we will never be able to account for are the number of people who are talked out of getting an EV by this process. And the yeah. only way to fix it is to not make it easier to sell a gas car. Do yeah. better training and possibly appropriate sales uh, incentives, you know, economics around it. So if they're making more money selling the gas car, they're always going to try to sell the gas car. And if they're unfamiliar with the electric car and they feel uncomfy talking about it, they're never going to be good at it. Yeah. Regardless of any of these other things around service and stuff, except that I know for sure that just like there's the car guys and bean counter model at the OEM level, there is a sales and service rift at the dealer level. So the best thing to do to sell electric cars is simply to understand that the salespeople would love nothing more than piss off the service guys. So if selling EVs do that, they'd oh, sell really? them all day long. Oh, so this really? is not an issue of like sales guys not selling EVs because they're afraid that there might be service revenue lost. <laughs> that would oh, be an easy win for them to take because oh, there's yeah. that kind of friendly rivalry. Oh, I see. Everybody's on for their own, huh? They're like... Well, it's just a general, you know, everyone, each side kind of looks down on each other. There's teens in all things. Yeah. Okay. So then, yeah. So then let's talk about your uh, relationship with Tesla, because obviously, I mean, you know, Elon, yes. right? Uh, from a long time ago, right? From the beginning and stuff. Uh, and you, uh, you like Teslas, right? You like, the cars are great, right? I mean, it's a great product. Yeah. Um, and you just, I, yeah, I think I agree with you. Like, I feel like an outsider from the, the Tesla community because, again, I was never, I could never own, afford one. And yeah. I remember being so excited for the mission, for the thing, you know, at the beginning. And I would, like, go to, like, these events or whatever where, like, then talk to people about Teslas. And they, they all were, like, great. They were so accepting. They yeah. were like, oh, my God, this is great. Right until the point when then they would find out that I didn't own a Tesla, that I own a homemade car. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh, you have to make your own car? Oh, my God. Okay, I'm going to go talk to my friends over there, you know, my rich friends over there. You know, I, it happened so many times with me that I, I felt so rejected by then. I'm like, these people are weird. These are all a bunch of, like, rich people who think they're better than everyone. You know, not, obviously not everyone. Yeah, but we'd normally be invoking a German brand. With this description. <laughs> yes. Yeah. A portion. Yeah. Uh, but um, so I always felt kind of like an outsider. Right. And then obviously now, you know, I, I'm doing better. I can afford Tesla. Uh, but I'm like at this point, it almost doesn't make sense to be to buy a Tesla because I'm kind of a DIY guy now. I make electric cars. I've made one uh, several for me. I made several for for customers. You know, I worked at EV West for a little while uh, oh, yeah. doing that stuff. And then, you know, it's like, I'm not, it's almost like it goes against my brand to, to own just a store-bought Tesla. Like, if I get a Tesla, maybe I have to do a thing sort of like Rich Rebuilt did, where, where you buy one or that's cut in half and, or, you know, put, yeah. put two together somehow and, you know, DIY something out of it, right? So I totally see your point. I see, I see the Tesla community uh, and how they easily have swallowed that that pill right and they join the cult kind of thing and so yeah. i'm like uh yeah i grew up in a in a in a super like traditional religious you know upbringing 
and I I've, I've stepped away from that in my in my you know adult life. I see a lot of similarities. I I recognize those traits in the community from Tesla, and I'm like, oh okay, yeah, it's like Elon can't right. do no wrong. Huh? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, sh for sure. And and obviously, like we talk about Apple, same way early Apple fans and things like that. But yes. I mean, so obviously, I got to know Tesla very very early on, and I was I I've always liked them as a company and champion what they're doing and. I did a minute and a half of consulting for them way back in those early years, planning the Roadster launch and have no, I mean, JB goes back to a startup in the nineties. So they, they were my people, especially when nobody else was building anything at all. And yeah. at the time, um, a buddy of mine, the CIA director, who's in the first film, Jim Woolsey, he called me up one day and said, I'm coming to the Bay area, come up and meet me. And I to just take me around to everything going on. And he was involved with a venture capital firm that I later joined. And so of course I took him to Tesla. And it, these were the days when I would just like walk through the door with somebody in tow, somebody that I decided Martin needed to know and wander through the building till I found somebody I knew. And so ultimately that led to Vantage Point becoming one of Tesla's first big investors from a venture capital standpoint. Later, wow. my husband ended up working for Tesla. He was um, early service uh, person on the Western region. So helped set up Ranger service and ran the LA service store and everything basically from Texas to Hawaii was his. And at night, you know, I, I would bake them cakes during the day and at night we'd go take our rock band equipment and have rock band nights with the staff and the big TVs in the showroom. And it was all very, wow. very friendly. And at one point when in between Martin and Elon being CEOs, when one of the other guys in the middle was there, I very nearly ended up on Tesla's board as part of Vantage Point and their representative there. And I would pick up cars on the weekends and go run events for, you know, work events and do media things and stuff where they didn't have the staff to do. And so long time wow. Tesla supporter in various ways, no yeah. access to grind at all. But neither do I tend to advertise all of these little things. And, and yeah, I'm kind of sporadic on social media, but I'm not one of those people that posts every single thing I ever do, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So. That's been the premise of Tesla. And later when the narrative started to change a lot, much more towards Elon himself doing all the things versus Tesla doing all the things. But also as I started to see a lot of the customer service kind of slip for a while and, yeah. and lack of recognition that, that the community really co-creates their success. And I mean, I know lots of Tesla drivers and most of them are very wonderful people there are some assholes that chime in on YouTube or send me private notes. I mean, it, it was a joke for quite some time that the easiest way for me to get death threats was to say something about <laughs> oh, Tesla geez. that didn't suggest they were perfect or okay. to say something remotely nice about GM. Those are the two uh, most trusted methods. Wow. So yeah, I mean, if that's your bar, if you have to believe they're perfect or you're a hater, then yes. And yeah. of course, all of this was pre-Tesla Q. I mean, it all seems so quaint to me now of, me going, you know, my basic, yeah, you could provide better service to your owners is somehow deemed a hater compared to that. What happens now? <laughs> yeah. But that's kind of how that started. And it's, I mean, there's, there's tribes in all of this and there are other yeah. tribes with other companies. And so this is not unique, but that's where I fall. And so I'm aware that having that point of view about all the car companies of I'm happy to talk about what they do right and what they do wrong and whatever. And none of them are perfect and none of them are evil. Like that's just not how I relate to yeah. any of these companies. I get that. that you try to have a seen. balanced view. Yeah. And I have which, friends uh, in all of them and you know, there's, I don't pretend to be unbiased. I try to be fairly balanced. Yeah. And which is somehow a bad thing in today's society. I don't know how that's, yeah. It's a bad thing, but a lot of people see that, you know. <laughs> right. so, yeah. Yes. Wow. I didn't know that you were that involved. Yeah. I knew that you knew him back then and you were involved because, I mean, you were part of the, the, of the movement early in the days. Well, right? and I, for a minute and a half, I, I ran um, an automotive X Prize before it became the one that it ultimately became. And that's actually how I met Elon the first time. <laughs> I ah. hadn't yet met him through Tesla. He was, it was so early that he wasn't quite as involved. As involved. He was just and a. Yeah, so I'm running this, this X Prize, and he was on the board. I'm probably still is of X Prize, and so we ran into each other in the hallway once, and I was asked to describe what we're doing, <laughs> and he looked at me and said, "Why the fuck would you do that? We would just win." And that was <laughs> my very first conversation okay. with him. <laughs> I was like, okay. All right, nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah. So you know the the trials and the problems that Tesla's had with service. 
in particular have been real, right? Yeah. Uh, are you familiar with that thing with Rich Rebuild's uh, accounts yeah. of the thing? Well, I had at a... least generally. <laughs> yeah, I so they really did a number on him, right? He bought a a used one because he was one of these guys that like I totally get why they wouldn't want someone like him, right? He's kind of like a hack and he's making fun of them and then he's putting this two things together and he has no idea what he's doing. Yeah. Right? He doesn't know. He's not a mechanic. He's not a thing. Um he's just trial and error his way. He's like me. I'm I'm that person, right? I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just trying my uh, and error my way through things. And meanwhile, being successfully, like, loud. <laughs> and so it doesn't align well with their image. So I could see where they'd be like, oh, my God, this, you know, this guy, this dumb guy is just making too many waves, uh, making us look bad. But then he genuinely bought a car, a right. used car, and they totally did a number of them. I mean, they just had him going, I think, twice, back and forth to dealers and the car wasn't there and when they got the car the car wasn't ready and it was it wasn't and he meanwhile while all this stuff was happening he was being loud about it he was making videos about it and he's being rightly so being critical on the the yeah. treatment that he was getting you know he was looking at it from a perspective as a as a consumer right. and uh, no one would like to do, go through that you know and well, it, yeah And it was crazy because he, to his credit, he never disclosed that Tesla was vindictive and they totally just cut off his uh, his uh, affiliate thing, his referral program thing. They just disqualified him for no reason, really. Just, you know, it was basically because he, they didn't like him being negative, outspoken, the uh, negative or critical on them. Um, right. Well, this, I mean, what I think is interesting <laughs> Mm -hmm. a euphemism for many purposes about <laughs> yes. that sort of thing is the vindictiveness is not new. <laughs> it goes back a, a dozen years or so. I mean, it's a long-standing thing. And to some degree, being the squeaky wheel was the way to get your stuff done. I mean, especially going back to the bricked battery days, which started as Um, hi, here's your $40,000 bill for your battery pack because you were dumb enough to leave it on a boat to, you know, Eastern Europe without plugging it in or whatever stupid thing that always happened in order to break a battery pack. Mm -hmm. But if you complain loudly enough, then it became something else and, and it led to warranties that have served everybody else. So mm -hmm. in some ways, it's been good for the longer term effects, but this notion of needing to be loud and complaining and everybody tweeting Elon versus being able to go through normal service channels to get decent service on your car has yeah. been around forever. And yet the punishment involved, the vindictiveness, whether you're a member of the media or an owner or whatever, is also not new and not consistently applied. And the fan base tends to believe, generally speaking, that you deserved it. If you're Ed Niedermeyer, There's no way you ever had a valid point. Everything you ever got, you deserved, and you probably deserve more of it. But yeah. Rich is a more sympathetic character, and yet the general approach is kind of the same. And those are the types of things that I have always rubbed up against when it comes to Tesla. Is It's unnecessary, and it's not helpful. And these are people that handed you often six figures or more. So, yeah. frankly, you have no right, <laughs> in my opinion, to treat some of them the way that they have Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, at the beginning, I mean, it was a very like exclusive like club, right? Yeah, they were all rich, but they all believed in the thing that they were almost like they believed in your mission. So that's why they were giving you a bunch of money so you can do this right. car. You were early adopters. You understood that it was going to be, you know, it, it wasn't a, like a perfect thing that was already, you know, oiled up and ready to go. Um, but now we're getting to the point where they're like a, a normal like a real car company that should have normal procedures, departments and stuff to get right. repairs. Like no one, that's terrible service. Like right. if anybody yeah, did that. And them, it doesn't yeah. matter if you're rich or not. I mean, it's terrible, yeah. terrible service, no matter who you are or how you got your car. I mean, yeah. I understand the, the tension between the right to repair and some of the early stuff and, and some of Rich's initial issues actually also started way back in early roadster days where, a couple aftermarket shops were trying to buy truly totaled vehicles. 
and rebuild them. And I can completely sympathize with Tesla and Nissan and everybody else who has struggled with this around the notion of putting non-roadworthy vehicles back on the road. And if something happened with them, especially in the earliest days of EVs, it yeah. would not, the story would not be like some yeah. poorly reconstructed car in an aftermarket shop caught fire. It would be a Tesla caught fire and EVs, yeah. you know, the, the ramifications of that are significant. And so I understand, <laughs> I also understand the right to repair and there's a different, different calculus 10 or 12 years into a technology versus the first couple of years yeah. and from a parts availability perspective, but also a technology maturation perspective. Yeah. But yeah, that I'm... doesn't change how you deal with the people. And yes, we're further along, but whether they were the earliest EV1 drivers who poured all their money in, into a Tesla Roadster instead of a vacation, because a lot of them were that. They weren't people that normally bought expensive oh, cars. Yeah, yeah. Or it's today. Even today, we're still early adopters. That runs yeah. through 14% of the market, and we're still sitting around 2% nationwide and high, high single digits in California. Yeah. They are more tolerant of infant issues with yeah. one caveat. You have to be transparent with them. You have to have bi-directional communication and be transparent. The moment they think you're stonewalling them, rich or not, you're yeah. done. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. we've seen it over and over and over again with when we learned it at GM back in the day, but I've seen it with Tesla, I've seen it with Nissan, I've seen it with Chevy. That is the balance. And so yeah, sure, fine. You have service issues, you have capacity issues, and Tesla drivers are more sympathetic to every issue Tesla's ever had, as long as you're being straight with them and transparent and respectful in your communication. But when you start to stonewall, that becomes the problem. And and yeah. that's unwarranted. Yeah, yeah. You're making enemies after that. <laughs> right. And it's unnecessary. Yeah, it's unnecessary. I think so. Yeah, because you, yeah, you go from being someone that loves the mission, loves the thing, to just being feel like, you know, you're a victim of them. You're like, ah, I'll never buy one of those. I, yeah, there's a lot of people who have have those views, right? That they've turned into like, I had a Tesla and I'd never buy another one again. And you're like, oh, that's yeah. terrible. That's a terrible position again, I guess. But well, well I haven't seen haters, but I, I mean, I have seen and I, I've watched the transition towards. I had Teslas. Mm -hmm. I still root for what they're doing. I'm also ready to, for a more mature Try experience. something else? Yeah. Yeah, whether it's a different product or just simply a company with more developed infrastructure. And some of this is geographic, depending on where these people live. But yeah, yeah. I get it. Of like, I still root for Tesla. I'm not going to trash them. But I also don't wouldn't mind having a service center within 50 miles, <laughs> you know? Yes. Yeah, that's or a thing. a car that doesn't rattle as much or whatever the case is. Yeah, or the the, the, the windshields don't come off mid freeway yeah i mean you know like listen that happens with all the cars but uh definitely and there's some double standards too and that's yeah that's part of the other in, in all of these things and all of these stories the double standards are also one that i end up challenging some of if this was any other car company would you tolerate it and yeah. the answer is always you know opposite of what they apply to tesla but not necessarily for defensible reasons and we yeah. see the same thing as other car companies do things. You know, the Mach-E gets launched or it's like, oh, they just ripped off Tesla. And if they yeah. don't do that, then it's, well, you should have done what Tesla does. I mean, there's no winning in there's some ways no with winning. the others. So we want them all to join and sort of how dare everyone's not making EVs. And yet with a certain contingent of people, there's also no winning when they do. So yeah. trying to encourage and pick apart that conversation is one of the bigger challenges we have, but a really important one. Yeah. So out of all the other car manufacturers, then which one are you putting your money on or which one are you are you rooting most loudly for? I know you, you know, you're, you kind of balance or whatever. But if, if you were to pick one, because you just mentioned the Maki -E, earlier, we mentioned the Rivian. Uh, those are two major ones. I know Porsche is coming up with their thing. But generally, that speaking, that's like kind of like a rich man's car, too. Right. It's too. Yeah. It's too rich for most of us. Um yeah, what 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 is in the uh, in the market or in the near future market that you uh, are ex particularly excited about? Well, the cars I'm personally excited about, we can't get here. No, <laughs> um, but I th I mean certainly I think I and others are excited for what Rivian represents and and what it may do in, for the truck. Yes, the truck is cool, but also for the package delivery vans, and I like yeah. a lot of those 
not premium private passenger vehicle spaces of EVs. I like non-road and goods movement and transit. And, and I think mm. certainly this notion of we have to drive the conversation past incentivizing private, largely premium EVs mm. has to happen, especially in the urban space. I mean, I'm LA, you're LA. We're like, we're all living in this space where we can't expand you know, another billion people population wise, hand them all a private car and a single family house and think we'll all fit in the space of land we have. <laughs> to yeah. say nothing of equity and access and frankly, a decent quality of life. So all of those conversations have to happen, but I, it's not so much uh, excited about, but I have high expectations that I, I mean, Volkswagen group has to put up or shut up. <laughs> oh. So it's not so much like, oh yeah, I'm so excited. I am excited to see the volume of EVs that they're that they could put out. They're promising. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they have no excuse not to do so. Yeah. This year is I kind have... of the one that they keep teasing towards, and and f especially in this country, like you know, Audi's already had two plug-in models. Porsche also has had several models, not as high volume, but. And and the management, you know, Audi's former president is now Volkswagen's president in the U.S. and stuff like, and and the CEO of Volkswagen has been at several different car companies that have all done EVs. I don't have as much tolerance for them not succeeding <laughs> as I might with a brand new company with brand new management who's never done for this nonsense. Before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's a little bit of like, okay, fine. I get that this is kind of your first big rodeo, but we're also ten years into this generation of EVs, and anybody mm -hmm. launching right now should have been learning from everything that came before. So if you're making the same early mistakes that everybody else made in the, in the early 2000s, get early on board. Teens, uh, no, sorry. <laughs> yeah. How, how did you, okay, I have particularly strong feelings about that, um, that diesel gate thing. Um, yeah. I, and I think it's because I love Volkswagen so much, yet I hate them so much. Like they're just a, to me, they're like the worst of the worst, right? Because uh, I, I, it's just a betrayal. I mean, it, it, they got caught several times and they didn't learn their lesson and they they keep promising a bunch of things, but they're not having materialized. And so I'm I'm like there with you. I'm like, ah, whatever. I'm like, maybe if they bring the cars, deliver the cars, we'll see. You know what I mean? But yeah. but definitely, yeah, like zero room for, for shenanigans with them because they we've – We've obviously I know. been through well, them. Oh my God. I mean, I grew up in a Volkswagen bus. They had been promising an electric Volkswagen bus for so years. many years now. 20 <laughs> years. I'm like Gen <laughs> 6 of the bully concept. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and obviously, Dieselgate, I mean, it, it, in some ways, it's the crushing of the EV1 for Volkswagen. It's much bigger in some ways, but from that black eye perspective and the thing they have to overcome, which is more prominent in the US than in some other areas. You think so? In other places, it's not a, such a big thing? The people are just like, whatever. It's not as much of a conversation in oh, other places. Um, yeah. And in part, we've had far more litigation here and far yeah. more punishment. Uh, and it's not that it's unwarranted, but it just yeah. hasn't been as much of the broader conversation in other areas of the world. And and it's not just two bolts, I can, right? Uh, didn't I hear that all kinds of other manufacturers have gotten caught with cheating devices? Yes. Well, okay. th that's the other thing. And it's uh, certainly the other German manufacturers. And so on <laughs> okay. one hand, okay. what a bunch of turds. On the other hand, <sighs> I, I'm cynical enough and old enough that I know better than to expect any car company and certainly any, maybe any corporation mm -hmm. to behave well <laughs> across all fronts. Ethic ethically, yeah. Yeah. I, mean, ethically I also get to... the notion of you know, those that cause the issues are not necessarily the same, in a company that big, not necessarily the same people. Like when Electrify America started, and I mean, even that was built on a previous promise by Audi to build out a nationwide charging network. And okay. then Dieselgate happened. And then it was like, oh, maybe we make this thing Electrify America. And everyone oh. kind of crapped on it in the notion of those that cause the problems are the same ones that are now ch tasked with building out charging. And Generally speaking, it's not the same. I mean, it's not the same people as Dieselgate at all. There's a few incumbent Volkswagen people now at Electrify America, but it was largely new folks. And so I also get that notion of they're going, just give us a chance. <laughs> yeah. And also you know, the other criticism that I've heard is that they're going to make money off of of Electrify America, right? So it's like you're not, it's not like a, 
you know, it's it's just, you're rewarding them <laughs> for doing yeah, this bad thing, kind of thing. <laughs> that's certainly the criticism, and and I understand the concern. Um, and and in full disclosure, I have done things with Electrify America, not in a few years, but certainly in the early days. I think it's we also have to note nobody is making money on charging, and so there's no foregone conclusion that they're going to be rewarded. I understand yeah. that the strategy was if they ha they have the opportunity to make it a profitable endeavor, they're more likely to make it into something that is useful, that customers yeah. are using or no one will make money, that is yeah, supportive yeah. versus just forcing them to write checks as is also happening in the appendix D portion of the settlement to each state. And then it gets div divvied up and tossed out there in some hodgepodge of funding, but there's not yes. really any sort of tracking or adult uh, supervision or anything like that. It just disappears. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I understand both sides of the argument and, and I, I could easily argue either one of them, but it's still TBD if Electrify America makes any money. Same as ChargePoint, EVgo and all the others. I mean, there's a couple companies in Europe that have done profitable charging, but otherwise it's still it, a bit of a It's a challenging uh, marketplace. Uh, I mean, you know, endeavor yeah. to charge, And right? in fairness, EVgo started momentum i mean it technically existed but it got its its traction out out of a settlement with california and the other major charging companies have all been very dependent on public funding so it's yeah. a little bit of like you know pot calling the kettle black in some ways because none of the charging companies have built themselves a successful business case that didn't rely on public subsidy in some yeah. form taxpayer rate payer utilities or settlement yeah Oh, wow. Yeah. So this, I mean, I think in the long run, we all need it and it has to happen. I, I think it's the only way to have successful cars, right? Electric cars is by having a, an extensive fast charging network because this, this having huge batteries on each car, this, this is not going to work. You don't need 500 miles, 400 miles uh, per charge, you know, battery on board. Right. Like why? Why do you? You don't need that. You can't just have giant cars. Don't just have massive tanks. You know, it's like seventy gallon tanks or something. It's like no, you just you make them smaller because you can charge everywhere, and then that's how that's how it works. So right. Well, that's we also right need more attitude. education on on home charging, other passive yeah. charging at shopping malls or at work or whatever. I mean, yeah. charging a, an EV is much closer to charging a phone than filling a gas car. Yeah. And so we need a framework of fast charging from a psychological perspective to make people comfy. But I'm also concerned about the degree to which we are forcing future transportation to behave like past. We're yeah, still obsessed with this gas station model, and that's the only way and the best way to well, fill I your think car. Well, I think we plan but it's for also the, the most worst expensive. Case. Yeah, it's yeah. The most expensive, and so especially now that we're pitching it as the answer for apartment buildings and stuff. You're forcing those with the fewest financial resources towards the most expensive charging. <laughs> yeah. It's not going to work. No, very but well. I, I think the reason is because we plan for the worst, right? Like, we, we're we like. Sure, an appropriate amount of what if I want to take. Well, what if I forget country? to charge one morning and I have to make it to work? Right. Like, if it's a slow charging means I'm not going to make, I'm going to be six hours late or I'm going to be 20 minutes late, then it's a huge thing, right? So we want to. We go through so much trouble. It's like, I just want to be able to forget one morning to, or one night to charge. Or I want to be able to drive up to, you know, San Francisco. Right. On plan, on, you know, just out of, on a whim. Just go, you know, for the weekend or whatever. And fast charging is the only thing that will allow that to, do, that to happen. Right? And that's so, why a basic framework of it is important. Yeah. Pitching it as the answer for yeah, all it's, use it's cases. Not <laughs> yeah. Not so much because other things are far more convenient yeah yeah cheap. slow charging is the way to go because it's less harmful on your equipment fast charging is not good on your batteries it's not good on infrastructure it's not good for the grid it's like all kinds of things right um and the and besides the car sits there all night doing nothing like in all day by the way when you go to work what's, what's your car doing all day sitting yeah. in the parking lot should be slow charging over there yeah so and, totally and i get sense. not everyone can charge at home but there's also public grazing it's I yeah. mean, EV charging in public is grazing versus gorging, generally speaking. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, when you put it that way. <laughs> go to the mall, you get an hour. You go to the grocery store, you get 20 minutes, whatever the case is. Yeah. And that also is an easy supplement for those that cannot charge at home. 
And yeah. we sort of forget that. We, be, we become obsessed with the gas station fill-up model. And yeah. that has its place, but it's not the only place. <laughs> it's, it's actually very inconvenient. I, I hate going to the gas. I hated going to a gas station forever. It's like you have to go out of your way. Like this, this I've been driving my DIY electric car now yeah. for eight years. Uh, it's great. I charge every <laughs> once in a while at home. I never have to worry about it. I'm like, oh, oh, let me just plug in. And even that, it's like a, a short to like, oh, let me go grab the thing out of the wall and stick it on there. And I'm like, I'll do it tomorrow. Because I, I, I don't commute as much anymore. Right. Right? So, <laughs> I know, <But> me too. <laughs> definitely having to, like, if you're going somewhere, if you're going to work and it's like, oh, I have to stop at the gas station. It's, uh, it's inconvenient, you know? I think sure. in the future, I think there will be a thing where, like, there's going to be everywhere. Like, yeah, the park installs maybe, like, a pad where you, you park your car and it just starts charging. Or while you're waiting online for your drive through then there's some charging going on there. You know, it's like, and you just have a kind of an account, like a universal account that it's just you get charged and billed for that or something. Right. I yeah, totally some utilities are looking at that, having everything billed back to your home utility bill just because yeah. that's already a centralized source. But yeah, I yes. think the parking lot thing is a, it's a potential wireless charging opportunity that hasn't really been spoken of. Like I think wireless charging at home is completely overblown. It's a bright, yes. shiny object. And it's premised on the notion that EV drivers believe plugging in is inconvenient. And I have yeah. never met an EV driver that thinks that. <laughs> So well, I'm me. one of them, right? But it's not so inconvenient that you'd never do it. I'm just saying, like, like I do it every once in a while because I don't have to do it every night. Well, but plugging in versus gas station or something. Oh, yeah, yeah. Else, no. Like, the I'll, 10 seconds I'll of plug plugging in. in is not a big deal no. when it comes to fueling. Oh, yeah. And mm -hmm. it would be one thing if wireless charging was an extra 100 bucks, but it's an extra few thousand dollars. <laughs> so right now, I don't yeah. know anyone who thinks it's that inconvenient. But yeah, yeah. Paving a parking lot, if you're already yeah. building one, with wireless spaces that have no com connector compatibility issues, yeah. you don't have to worry about someone cutting off the copper, things yeah. like that, I think, in the medium term, could be really interesting. Yeah, I think so. And, and it's because that charger, it's, it, so you'll be sharing the expense with a bunch of cars. Every car that right. parks in there will be, right? Where at home, it's just you. It's just, it's, come on, just plug it in. What are you doing? Yeah. Unless you're that rich, I guess. <laughs> which they exist but but yeah definitely uh in a mass market right or, or yeah it doesn't make sense but i yeah i think the charging in parking lots does need to happen because people don't want to have to plug everywhere I, I guess it could become inconvenient having to plug everywhere oh i'm going to the you know grocery we store we do it with our everything. phones you go around Do the house, like you come across, well, it depends, but I, I think many of us. Yeah. Do you, you don't have a battery that lasts you all day? Depends on the age of the phone. When it's uh, new, sure. But also, uh, I mean, I even when, certainly when traveling and things like that, if you're at an airport, you're getting on a plane, it's going to be a few hours, like you plug yeah, in plug preemptively in. a little bit to make sure yes. it's, it's not quite range anxiety, but you're, you want to make sure you have a bit of spare. And same yes. thing when we do, you know, conferences and stuff, then we run around spare battery packs to ensure oh, the yeah. same thing. I bring so, my yeah. giant battery. Yeah, you're always looking for that plug. Right. And it doesn't I, seem inconvenient, though, to do, like, it's true. okay, yeah. you learn to just... I'll sit on there's... the floor. I'll sit yeah. on the floor if there's a plug there instead of a comfortable chair at the... You get in your car, you plug it in, even if you don't really need to, but why not? Yes. you're. Yeah, you're right. Which is a weird thing, right? I, I kind of do... Because I do many things. Right? It's kind of hard to explain what I do. But I make videos about this stuff all the time. And it's about my interest. And I'm interested in batteries and electric cars and, you know, renewable technologies and stuff. So that's what I'm mostly making videos Great. about. Um, but I keep telling people, like, you guys don't understand how much energy we use. Elect electric energy. Electricity. Like, because our grids are mostly kind of stable. But right. as soon as they're gone, like, within seconds... Now you're you can't do whatever you're doing, right? You're because like we're all doing this remote thing now because of this pandemic thing. No, I'm not doing that. If you're working from home, guess what? You're not working from home because you don't have electricity to turn your TV on or your computer or your thing or your router. I'm saying your uh, internet. I mean, the no, rest internet. of it can be compensated. But <laughs> internet yes. ends up being this the block. And here's the thing: if you're out of power, then your service provider station repeater thing or whatever substation a few blocks away from you probably is out of power too 
Yes, they have some batteries, backup batteries, but they're only good for like six hours or something. After that, you're on your own. And it's starting to happen here in California uh, because of the winds and, you know, the whole thing, the whole Wild mess fires. with the yeah, yeah with the, with the people suing the our utilities, right, and stuff. Uh, so we're starting to get these, these shutdowns. Yeah. And people are starting to realize that it's like, holy crap. When the power's out, your life kind of stops. Right. Well, right? that's, I mean, that's calculated too. It's a game of chicken from the utilities who've basically said, oh, mm -hmm. you're going to hold us responsible for when we mm -hmm. set neighborhoods on fire? Yeah. Well, okay, we're just going to preemptively shut off your power. Let's just cut your power. <laughs> that, how short sighted are they? They're like, well, you're not going to give me power 100% of the time? We'll find another way. Like, right. we'll replace you. We're not going to, you know, it what exacerbates I mean, but... the death spiral, but they don't yeah. necessarily understand that yet. Yeah, I'm, it's great for me because I'm selling batteries. Up the, I mean, right. I'm building a whole build uh, business out of repurposing batteries so that you can put up a backup thing at home. Yeah, And absolutely. everybody's seen the value of it because they're like, hey, we're trying to do our job here. We're trying to – my kids can't go to school because they, they don't have electricity. You know, it's like – so all of a sudden it becomes a real issue uh, with this energy. But people don't, don't get it, right, because if you're not here, if you don't see it um, – and and the biggest thing, also the the exciting thing about that in electric cars is that the biggest battery that you will, the normal people will ever buy is going to be in a car. Yes. And so right now it's early. We still don't have this this thing, this V to G or whatever vehicle to grid technology that needs to happen also because you should be able to be at home and plug your car in and have a charge but it also sh you should be a bi-directional thing so that it pulls off in case there's a you know yeah at least vehicle to building to building yeah not vehicle to grid and yeah. and especially as nissan and mitsubishi started doing that in japan after the fukushima disaster yeah so uh -huh. it's been quite a long time that bi-directional power has existed has existed with evs there yeah but generally speaking, they sort of figure there's no market for it here. Even Elon, like not too long ago, he's like, "Yeah, you don't need it." Like, people want. To... I'm like, "Come on!" Although, well, and I mean, you could. It would be understandable for someone to potentially think he might take that position because he has power walls to sell. None uh -huh. of the auto automakers also sell stationary storage. <laughs> That's true. So there's less of a reason for them to take that position. There is yeah. some concern over battery warranty. And yeah, the notion of if you're adding extra cycles, but micro cycles, yeah. because well, well, exactly. Now that just, we're several years into deployment, it's not. Yeah. If, if someone were trying to do daily arbitrage, sure, yeah. maybe. But for emergent use, resilience, yeah. then yeah. it's not necessarily a big deal. So I, I mean, I would expect that automakers would start dipping the, their toes into these waters with parameters, X number of cycles per year or under certain conditions or for a certain amount of time at well, not more than a week at a time in case of disaster or something like that. Yeah, definitely for emergency. Um, yeah. So yeah. there's no good reason that they don't do that. And as long as we don't try to go back of the meter, then the utilities themselves don't need to get all twitchy about it because they do. <laughs> they do, yeah. But they, they have a loosened battle. We're all doing this. We're like, like in California, we're installing solar everywhere. We have too much solar. It's too I, much yeah, solar. The, that... Yeah, the dragon curve, yeah. Yes, it's like we're, we're taxing our grids in the morning. Like we don't know what to do with this power. We yeah. have to try to pay someone else to take it. We well, could they, all be they charging our batteries. cars to charge at 1 p.m. We used to tell everybody, please don't charge in the early afternoon. Now we're going, please charge your car, your cars at 2 p.m. Yes. Have at it. <laughs> yes, because there's a there's a surplus of energy, and I think the second wave of this, which is dumb, I don't know why legislators haven't woken up to the fact that they should be mandating solar panels. They should be mandating batteries <laughs> storage. But they, no one's doing that, right? I mean, like, as far as, I guess they're kind of pushing. I know some legislation is starting to change a little bit. They're starting to incentivize some people in some regions, I think, right, where you're almost, you could almost get, like, a battery for free if you're in certain regions and stuff. Um, uh, or at least a large portion of that will be subsidized by by the grid or by some program or something. From the yeah, standpoint. I mean, certainly allowing utilities to rate-base more distributed assets could be helpful because it's one thing to tell either residents or businesses you have to spend this extra money on these extra assets yeah. and utilities have mostly not liked 
residential solar and things like that because they don't own it and it competes with their business. Yeah. But if they're allowed to rate base it the same way they do chargers now in many cases, then that lowers the barrier for them. It alleviates the capital expense for the resident or the commercial property or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And it gets more of it out there that is controlled by the utility and therefore liability and all that was, is with the utility. But the benefit is shared by the customer. Yeah. So we need to get a little bit less staunch on how utilities participate in some of this because they have capital to deploy in a yeah. time when fewer and fewer people do and they have yeah. this sort of death that's spiral concern. So Yeah, and that's a, also a balanced view. It's not because I, I, I fall into this too, right? Where it's like me against the world. You know, and I preach that, you know, it's like, ah, screw them. You know, let's set up our own batteries. I'm a DIY guy. I, yeah. I've, I made a, a whole career out of sticking it to the man kind of thing, right? But it's not the right approach all 100% of the time. I mean, you know, we, we live in this community. Choices are good. Yeah. So and, if and, you can and want to do the DIY thing, great. Yeah. I, sh my mother is not the ideal person for a conversion. Yeah. Yeah. No, and only I you, suggest that she get a volt and call it a day. Yes, and only <laughs> the same like would be true for batteries. Yeah, declaring war on the on the grids is not the right thing. Like, look, they've been providing us power for a hundred years. You know, more than hundred years. Like, you, that's a value there. Like, they're fairly stable now. They're you know every once in a while they start. Like, you should prepare to kind of stand on your own if you can afford it. So, but we should all do something that's like collectively good for everyone, right? Right. Like. Uh, but like facing your pa solar panels to the west instead of the south, that helps the grid instead of helping your, your bottom line, your, your pocket. Uh, some people might choose to do that. I think if you're in a position to do that, I would not discourage that. I'd be like, yes, do something that's good for the overall, you know, right. uh, benefit of the collective benefit, you know, of everyone. Uh, I, I would never tell people not to do something like that, right? But I, I do kind of have the tendency to fall like it's you know screw them you know gotta do this thing you know i kind of have to step back every once in a while and be like look you should kind of do this thing because it's the overall good for everything um i had someone recently from the air resources uh and and i i it come it was kind of like enlightening because i didn't know so much about the air and how bad we have it here right. and how we don't meet the, the national standards. And so how much of a, it's like a, it's a thing. It's a, it should be like a community thing to, to try to better this, right? Cause we're all breathing this air. Right. We're all, we're all on this together, you know? And that's kind of the thing that I like about Elon, where he says that sometimes about the mission, he's like, look, we only have one atmosphere. We shouldn't be playing Russian roulette with it and stuff. I kind of agree with that. I'm like, yes, you should electrify this stuff. And I think a lot of people don't get that. But is that, do you agree with that kind of sentiment? Sure. I mean, the science has demonstrated it. it for decades. Yeah. And that's, that's largely why California got the original EPA waiver to develop yeah. all of these programs to begin with. And yeah. other states have the option of copying carbs policies or going with the epa and they can hodgepodge this program from california there's you know not and so there's a dozen or so um, other states that copy the zero emission vehicle program for example and so that helps build up enough of you know 40 percent of the market or so is now covered in the carb state ah. like the section 177 states as we call them which are basically california oregon now colorado just joined and a bunch of states in the northeast so new york oh, new okay. jersey new hampshire all those vermont um, and so that's roughly where they are but more in the middle are starting to entertain the notion of if we ever want to see evs here and we ever want cleaner air we're going to have to start maybe thinking about becoming a carb state and it, it originated because our smog has been so bad our air so quality bad, has yeah. been so bad and there's lots and lots of studies that show that, you know, kids that live within one mile of a freeway have permanently diminished lung capacity, things like yeah. that. There's a certain number of deaths that are now attributed to it. And in England, the first little girl had it put on her death certificate that she died of air pollution specifically. Oh, wow. So this is a rolling snowball and why these yeah. things started. It was not originally a climate change issue. It was an air quality, smog, asthma, health issue. Yeah. <laughs> and those things continue. And I think there's, there's really valid criticism around, well, aren't EVs just for rich people? And certainly there's lots of effort towards getting costs down of EVs, but also some means testing programs around, you know, income caps, 
to qualify for the incentive and things like that. But there is also this basic notion of installing these technologies, whether it's solar or battery backup or EVs or whatever, the, the good air doesn't know a border between, you know, Manhattan Beach and Long Beach. Yeah. It travels everywhere. So all air improvement provides some communal good. And on the utility side, the way that utilities generally make money is they allow a, a rate of return on capitalized assets. Mm -hmm. And they divide up that cost among all their customers in the kilowatt hours they sell. And that's how they get their price per kilowatt hour. So the more throughput, the more electricity we collectively use, and by displacing gasoline with more electricity, it provides downward pressure on rates for everybody. Yeah. So there's that incentive as well, that the more things we shift toward electrons, <laughs> the, the lower the rates for everybody on all things, including plasma TVs or whatever it is you're using yeah. your electrons on. That doesn't happen with gasoline. So. Yeah there are some communal good aspects that tend to get overlooked in this general fight of EVs only benefit rich people. Yeah. Yeah. A, a long, in the long term, it's for everyone. Yeah. It's, I mean, I get it. it. When you're looking at a $60,000 Tesla, I understand that doesn't sound very sympathetic. And MSRP caps for incentives are appropriate too. I mean, in the 90s, we used to have them where we had a federal tax credit for the EV1 and other, the other cars but it topped out at $45,000. <laughs> so oh, wow. you couldn't sell $100,000 cars and still also get this incentive toward your car. Oh, and wow. I think we've yeah, lost gosh. some of that where we're talking about Porsche take hands and different things that yeah. it's hard to justify someone in Idaho incentivizing your Porsche, yeah. especially when we get into cars that aren't even available in a lot of these states. Yes. So we have to have the more challenging conversations yeah that's true yeah especially when you're talking about someone that also has a very low like low price we here in california we're paying like really expensive energy costs yeah. right electricity but it's some other states you know they're it's paying like seven cents, cents. yes yeah. exactly like, they're like solar panels for what right <laughs> why are we doing that that's why i kind of like doing the diy thing because it, it, i'm a i'm a poor guy right i mean maybe my bank account doesn't reflect that right now specifically but but I'm a poor guy. Like, that's my mentality. I come from nothing. I have no education. I have, you know, no connections to anything, to anyone. Um, and I, I think that's what I usually fight for, you know, for that, for me, for those people. I'm, I'm the person that doesn't have the means to do things right. That's why I'm like, DIY the thing, you know. Yeah. Don't ask permission. Ask forgiveness once you do it, you know. Once you're building the thing, you're driving. I'm, people told me that I could never just build a car, that I couldn't set a business, that I, like none of this stuff. It's all just, you know, I'm just figuring out as I go. You I know? totally get it. <laughs> and, you know, I'm not, you know, an ap unapologetic, really, because I'm like, hey, I'm here, you know. I came into this country legally. That's that's the worst thing when people sometimes are like, well, you you know, you legals and stuff. And like, oh, the, but you're not. You're one of the good ones. I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm the guy. I'm like the right. poster child of the person that you should be letting in. Like, you know, if you let us in, we can set up businesses. I've had employees. Uh, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm like, I'm not, not special. I'm just some other guy, right? Uh, and people kind of get to, to, multiple things can be true at once. Yeah, that's true. The older I get, the more I, uh, I do tend to agree with that. <laughs> Cause I do say like, there's a lot of people that call me like a farce, a, a charlatan, whatever. I'm a fraud yeah, or whatever. Too. And I'm like, yeah, there's some of that, <laughs> but I'm also someone that's doing stuff. Right. <laughs> so I'd like to keep it positive And I like to tell, I don't like to tell people not to do stuff i like to tell them what they can do and you know in this space it's like you could build an old car you yeah. know and make it an electric why because it's fun because it's good for the environment you're you're not putting a new car in here you're you know you're reusing something that's already there you know the the carbon footprint of that it's amortized you know through the years or whatever now you're just breathing more life into it and if it's electric it's even better you know yeah um I'm doing this thing, like my plan uh, for the future is, I love uh, the Hawaiian Islands. Yeah. I want to retire over there. How could you not? Right? And I'm like, I hate the fact that you, you, you have to like rent cars and there's big cars and they're always noisy and they're like these pristine environments and you're driving through them, you know? And I'm like, why can't someone have like a bunch of, like a fleet of electric cars out here, you know? It's like, so you can drive around the island. 
I would yeah. love to have my bus over there. And I thought like, well, why not make that happen? Why just, right. so, so that's what I'm doing. I'm building like a fleet of these buses and electrifying them. I'm shipping them awesome. over there. That's the, yeah, that's the plan. I remember my husband taking, went back at Tesla, they used to work out of the LA and Orange County stores, but they would have to cover all of the Western US. And so when a car broke in Hawaii, they'd have to get on a plane with some tools. <laughs> wow. Yeah, because there's, there's quite a bit of Teslas over there. Well, and yeah, they started back when there were about 10 roadsters was kind of the over under of when they started uh, going yeah. there versus trying to ship vehicles. Um, yeah. But yeah, it was always interesting. And the reception that they would get there where well, the roadster was a perfect size. The uh -huh. bigger EVs were sort of considered too big for a lot of the areas, but the Roadster was too expensive. And so it was the considered too flashy from a cultural perspective. Yes. So I mean, it was, even it was that, fascinating just to, to hear the receptiveness of the early days of, of these different areas and how they perceived them. Yeah. I mean, even now, right? I kind of, I forgot, like for a while I thought, well, $100,000 for a car, that's, you know, that's standard because that's what Tesla's were. <laughs> I right. Know. Except I didn't know one, so I didn't know what the bill was at the end of the month. And I bought this this Model Three for my wife, and I'm like, this is the most expensive car I've ever bought. Like, it's like six hundred dollars a month. Like, and it's only like forty thousand dollars. I'm like, wait a minute, a hundred thousand dollars is a lot for a like for a car. That's yeah. like crazy expensive. Yeah, uh, I mean that's what I think is. That, I mean, on one hand, yes, Teslas and others have gotten much more affordable. But I still kind of blanch a little bit at the Tesla folks that sort of point to everybody and go, Teslas are affordable. You should be able to get one. When, yeah. when from a new perspective, even 40 is on the low end and yeah. 40 is still a lot of money. Yeah, 40 is a lot and of money. We lose perspective on what regular people are yes. buying this year. Yeah, you have to keep you, you have to force yourself to keep getting there. Yeah. Uh, and the to, average to average transaction price for a car in this country is about 36 or so. So mm. it's in the ballpark of average. Yeah. And then with the incentives, so you are actually not... there. Because I don't know. My wife is really great at – she's frugal, right? I, I was going to get like a fully loaded one, but she's like, no. She – totally like i still drive a 17 year old saturn i know from frugal <laughs> okay <laughs> so we got bare bones like no upgrades whatsoever we got the black one with the, like like the cheapest tesla that we can get yep. right and then she went and found by the way we missed the whole 7500 thing but it was still 3500 so we got the right. half of that but then she was able to find like another five thousand dollars somewhere else through some other programs yeah. i think one was from like well, Southern California, California would have been, yeah, California would have been 2,500 and Southern California Edison is now a thousand dollars, but was I think four it was or 500. Like no, I, th yeah. I think we added up and like Edison wasn't that much, but yeah, th yes, there are several that are, I think we added it. It was like, oh, it's like $10,000 or something. I'm like, well, this is not a $40,000 car. It's more like a $30,000 car. Right. I was like, wow. Yeah. I mean, and there are incentives, but also not everyone qualifies for not all everyone of them. Qualifies. <laughs> And yeah. having to walk somebody, I mean, point being, we get very defensive about price and we miss the fact that most people are not thinking about all these other incentives only we know about. Yeah. <laughs> and people buy It wasn't easy. Payments. Like, I wouldn't have done it. She took the right. work and she yeah. called the numbers. I mean, it's like... And we have to work. make all of that much easier, which yeah. is also part of the dealership conversation, but we can make that information more transparent elsewhere also. Yeah. Yeah, because it's kind of a chore to go and look for that money, right? When you shouldn't, I mean, if you don't know to look for it, you're never going to find it. And you shouldn't have to get a college degree in buying an electric car. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it shouldn't be that hard. But def yeah, definitely, yeah, you have to keep in mind that, yeah, not everyone, especially now with this pandemic happening. It's yeah. weird because, like, now I, I, you know, I was talking to my brother and we own a little bit of Tesla stock here and there and, like, stuff. And, and we're looking at the Good markets for, for the first time, right? For the first times, we're looking at the markets, and then we're looking outside, and we're looking at the markets, and we're like, but that doesn't match. Like, there's a lot of people that are, like, out of a job right now. They're losing their businesses because of these lockdowns that we're having here in California. I'm like, how is the markets doing so great? They're all at all-time high. Everyone's like, I go, I think this is not reflective of what the reality is out here, right? And so I think hopefully 2021 – it's not going to be so terrible, but I think I think all that stuff is going to catch up to us, and it's going to be that much harder to own an electric car because they're yeah. expensive. And but it also invites 
some conversations that, I mean, the, here they kind of started in the pandemic, but they're encouraging around slower streets and maybe decreasing car dependency everywhere. Yeah. And certainly as people are working from home, yeah. you know, even if you want your car, you may not need a private car 24 seven every yeah. day. I mean, so certain sort of car sharing subscription yeah. plans that may sure. not have made sense a year ago actually might be more attractive now, but we also need to refocus on transit and yeah. goods movement and sort of less sexy <laughs> aspects that would yeah. have more good if they were electrified, but we always think about Teslas and so we don't really get there. And so those yeah. things need to happen a lot more as, and just generally decreasing car primacy in urban areas. Yeah. The, the slow streets movement of shutting down certain urban core streets so that people can use them for other things is not so uncommon in Europe. And we've seen places like Paris go, you know what, we're not going back after this. We've seen how much better it is from a quality of life perspective that, you know, the fact that we give so much real estate to cars all the time. The have, in Los Angeles, we have three spaces for every car. It's a huge amount of land yeah. compared to a huge housing deficit and other things we could be using that for. And so yeah. those conversations also have to become more of the EV conversation where electric transportation does not necessarily mean electric cars. And we have to get better at championing that broader swath of solutions, not just yeah. more tax credits for more you know, premium vehicles. Yeah, premium vehicles. Yeah, not everyone can afford them. You know what I'm doing on, I'm doing my little part on that side. Uh, you know, these companies, all these companies dump billions of dollars into these like mobility scooters and stuff. Yeah. And they're all going belly up now. Okay, so I am buying all those. And then cool. I'm I'm restoring them, restoring them. I'm taking the batteries off and we're building DIY power walls. We're putting them in cars. We're reusing all stuff. But a lot of these scooters, I'm actually sell, reselling to people so that they can ride around in their in their neighborhoods, you know? And they're they're fun. They're cheap. Yeah. Because now they're basically trash. They're essentially right. like e-waste. Now we just need to get them decent lanes to ride them in so that they're not competing in traffic lanes with yeah. cars. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We need to do that. But, I mean, obviously the only way to get there is to have more of them out there, right? And force. Yeah. Well, and to, and to advocate. And yeah. yeah. I yeah. mean, and electric vehicles solve quite a bit from a pollution perspective. There are aspects of private cars that making them electric won't solve. Yeah. for congestion and access and other issues. So yeah. we also have to work on those. So it's a, it's a matter of, of two things in parallel, electrifying all the things and yeah. reducing over time and in some areas, the ratio of cars versus other solutions. Because yeah. some people, I mean, I'm one of them that drives very little, five, five miles a week, which is why I still have my own Saturn. We got my husband a Bolt. I would easily get rid of my car tomorrow, except that in my neighborhood, there isn't much of anything else. So a little bit of transit scooter, bike lanes or scooter. Yeah, I'm get exactly. Scooter. Some combination, Ooh. cargo bike. <laughs> a cargo bike, yeah. <laughs> Lust after a cargo bike. Um, yes. So the more options we give people to do other things, even for some trips, that alleviates the congestion for those that still want to be in cars. Yeah, that's true. So, you know, yeah, lower parking minimums. You like said that. that your favorite car that you would own, it's not even here in the States. Which car is that? Honda E. So it's a Honda E, and it's a typically yeah. small car, right? Yes. I, I I love me some little torquey cars. I, I have the yeah. little Saturn with suicide doors. That's And it's that old. It's supercharged. It's very fun to drive. But it's the last car I, I bought know. with my company discount at GM. <laughs> Do I know which one that is? What is what is it called? A little ion. It's a just a little ion. Yeah, for a minute and a half they made supercharged versions of them. It's, what? It's manual, it's supercharged, doesn't oh. look like much, but it moves. Even oh. my twenty two year old kid lusts after my car. Wow. So. <laughs> oh, you have a supercharged Saturn. Saturn. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, supercharged cars are cool. Uh, yeah, torque is, it's, it's cool. It's fun. Yeah. So and it weighs like 2,400 pounds. So oh, it's still yes, one of the plastic right. ones. So. Oh, I see. But yeah, the Honda E is, it's very nostalgic yeah. looking back to the it's original It's like a little Civic. square one? Yeah. It's yeah, like an old okay. Civic. Yeah. Okay. And it's only like 150 miles of range, but I don't need a lot around here. Yeah. And how come and I like that the ID3 happened? as well, but that's also not coming to the States. The ID3. ID3. Volkswagen. That's like a little sedan, right? 
It's yeah, it's a little koopy thing also. Okay. Like yeah, a yeah. golf, sort of golf sized. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I think I saw that. That was recently up uh unveiled at the at the Peterson, wasn't it? Peterson Museum? Uh not the three. The ID four is the one that's coming oh, here. That's a crossover. Ah, I see, I see. Huh, okay. So how come that does hasn't happened? You think it will happen? You will you will Probably bring not. one of these cars? Manufacturers are convinced that Americans don't want sedans at all and okay. or cars versus crossovers and SUVs, and certainly not compact, subcompact ones. Oh yeah. Well yeah, I mean yeah, we don't we don't seem to like our little cars. We want them big. Look at me. I so I'm I'm getting a Rivian, right? But yeah. but I'm totally getting a Rivian just so that I can make content. Just so that I can yeah. be like Americans are are interested in trucks. Uh, and so I want to have one and I want to take it on the road and do some experiments with it, see how far I can go charging it only with solar or some nonsense. Right. We still kind of working on, uh, I want to make like a series, you know, yeah. uh, and just travel. Cause, the, cause it's supposed to be geared for outdoorsy, you know, uh, lifestyles and stuff, uh, which I, I don't know why I want to, I, I love watching outdoorsy stuff on TV. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I want to play with one. I just have no reason to own one. But, yeah, me neither. Yeah, I did Other a fully than... charged episode with them and back at their headquarters, and I'm like crawling in the cargo tunnel. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah, it was it was fun. I have an action grind with them too because they keep telling me they're not doing any any uh, interviews and stuff, and I'm like, what about so and so? And what about? I'm like, okay. <laughs> so. Um, Definitely, that's why I want to get that, right? And probably go hit, like, all the national parks because supposedly they're going to have a network of yeah, chargers. Yeah, that will be interesting to see as well. But they haven't really said where they're going to be at, right? And I don't, we don't know if they're starting now. I mean, they're supposed to deliver next year. I guess I know. installing chargers doesn't take that long. So you could. Well, and most of the ones in the parks, I am hoping, will be level two. Oh, you don't think they're going to be CCS combo? I, I don't think so. Um, they haven't been very specific, but but based on the intel I can gather, the sort of really highway adjacent ones are likely to be fast chargers. But okay. the parks, you're going there for hours. That's the whole point of going to the national that parks is. and stuff. So, and and that certainly from a there's a there's a, a woman called Kitty Adams who runs a, a little nonprofit called Adopt a Charger that for years has specialized in state and national parks. And so this is kind of her niche. And, and if Rivian hasn't already called her, they totally should, because she has solved a lot of these very unique wrinkles about the National Park Foundation and, and California State Park things. And there's lots of weird little wrinkles around power supply and who is allowed to monetize charging and things like that. So there, that will also help determine some of what speed ends up where. But level two would be useful in the destination areas stuff yeah. that's more transit oriented obviously would be faster but a an open question at this point is very much around the degree to which rivian tries to make another walled garden for yeah all of the success that tesla has had with superchargers many of us would argue we don't need more walled gardens and yeah certainly anything that is seeking public funding should be open to everybody and yeah. the double whammy of this one is also public lands yeah so but it would seem like it would be open, right? Because it's an open... Uh, well, the I mean, connectors are, but whether they yeah. choose the software uh, limit it to either only allow or to prioritize Rivians. Rivians. If, yes. if Rivian drivers are allowed to reserve <laughs> over That's everybody right. else and somebody else shows up and is stranded because some other driver who's not there yet has reserved it, all of those things are open questions. Yeah. But we're starting to see some policy sort of congeal around the notion of open access if publicly funded, which in my book should is... Should be, yes. Of course it's it should, appropriate. I mean, should not on. be a question. Right. Yeah, so, and the so problem we'll with the Rivians is going to be that they have giant batteries, and so they would take forever. I know. Charge. And there, I mean, since the dawn of EVs, there's been this fight of like Tesla or bigger battery drivers think they should get priority because they have bigger batteries. And like the little leaf drivers are going, but no, we should get priority because we don't have, like, we're quick. the ones that are going to be stranded. You should let us charge and move on. Yeah. So the yeah, etiquette. There's always that primacy. But at the end of the day, it'll be economics. Those who are willing to pay for whatever, first yeah. come, first served, is generally how it works and, and it should work. And it's a big, expensive truck. So I guess we're going to win. 
Move over, little people. No, no. <laughs> no. Uh, what about the Cybertruck? What do you think about that? It's a joke? It's a joke or it's a joke? <laughs> Those are your choices. Um, I don't know that it, I don't think it was a joke. Um, it was fascinating to be at the event. You went to the event. I was so, I'm also, I'm still hurting because I wasn't invited, so. Oh, well, um, yeah. I, I would say mostly we crashed. Um, oh, okay, okay, so you weren't, uh, you well, were Well, let's just say the fully invited? charged guys managed to talk me. Oh, that's talk right. my way in. They and didn't then, let your camera guys in. Well, and so another YouTuber gave me his plus one for our camera person because I am oh. not someone talented enough to shoot stuff on my phone. Oh, that's <laughs> right. I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was really hurt. I don't know why I was hurt. I'm I'm not into Tesla thing, but I was like, come on, I was should be there. Okay, whatever. Well, matter. and what's funny is I'm never the one that seeks to, like, I, I don't seek invites to these events. I go to some of them with so if I, if I'm asked, but I don't seek invites and I don't seek the first loan of a car and whatever. Uh -huh. uh, but it was, but I have because I've worked there. I've been to many of the launches, but this one was different in a way that was immediate and. Yeah. The folks that thought this was going to be a proper volume launch, it was obvious to me from the, from as soon as we got there that it wasn't just from the theme and the size and the location and everything. But it started with two Tesla owners looking at me as we're all shoved in the back of this overcrowded room, asking me what kind of car I have, which model. I told them I didn't have a Tesla and them going, well, how the hell did you even get in here? Who let you in if you're not an owner? Uh -huh. And then to watch in the span of five minutes, the crowd go from, I love you, Elon. Will you marry me, Elon? Shouting at him yes. to the truck rolling out and a collective <gasps> across the crowd and not in a good way. And then okay. immediately you see all these phones lighting up, like everybody checking Twitter to go, am I the only one that thinks that this is weird? <laughs> Okay. It was bizarre, this wave of phones lighting up. And I'm in the back corner of the room, so I could sort of see everything in front of me. And even to the end, 80% of the folks thought he was going to pull a Steve Jobs one more thing moment. Yeah. Like the real thing was going to roll out. And 5% thought that, you know, this is exactly what it is. You know, and Elon is perfect and can do no wrong. And if he says this is what we want, this is what we want. And the rest sort of figure that the real thing will appear later. But it was fascinating to watch all these diehards have this variegated experience over the span of an hour or whatever it was. Yeah, a lot of people had to do some really extensive mental gymnastics yes. to accept that, right? Uh, I I don't think I have that. So I was like, ah, this is a joke. It's a stupid looking truck. Like, might be the best truck in the world. Stupid looking. It's a it's project. It's too early. It's illegal like, in a half dozen ways. It <laughs> yes. Exists. Yes. I'm like, maybe in 20 years, I'll love the look of it. But now it's just ugly. I don't care. Like half, more than half the reason why we buy cars, it's because of the way they look. Like yeah. they're all do the same thing. They have four wheels and they take us to places. Well, I know, I four know doors. I think that it looks cool. And there are plenty of folks that want an Aptera or, or yeah. Wanted a PT Cruiser or yeah. you wanted an Aztec. I mean, there's there's plenty of examples of Aztec, yeah. polarizing vehicle design over yeah. the years. And so this is certainly one of them. One um, of them. It does not strike me as a volume project. It strikes me as a halo vehicle to the extent it gets built at all. I yeah. also find it fascinating that everyone's banking on the $35,000 price tag, given that Tesla has never once never. met any of its MSRP promises. Yes. Except for like three asterisks and super fine print. We'll, we'll yeah. pick five of them if you call it. Yeah, right. right. Nobody got the 35000 uh, uh Or the $49,000 model, model S or whatever. <laughs> I mean, you know, yes. there's there's always some fine print about we made one. But generally speaking, no. So yeah. I expect some price creep. <laughs> yes, that's going to be an $80,000 car uh, truck by the time. And, and those 000. that get it will think it's worth it and that's all fine. But I don't really compare yeah. it to like so a the, Ford F-150 or even The Rivian. $500 pre-orders, that's all just nonsense, right? That's trolls. $100, it's, yeah. It's well, $100. everyone's doing $100 refundable deposits. Yeah. I mean, even when it's $1,000, it's still, I mean, when it's not Tesla, everyone points and goes, you know, the mantra in the automotive world is take off all the zeros and that's the number of, of reservations you actually have. Because... <laughs> When it's a refundable deposit, why not get in line? 
Why and not so when it? the Nissan Leaf was taking deposits, doing that before it came out, everyone thumbed their nose at it and was like, that means nothing. When it's Tesla, it's gospel. No one will drop out. Every uh, single reservation is valid <laughs> oh, and an automatic yes. sale. And, you know, fine, whatever. But we'll, wow. we'll find out. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I guess. Yeah. Because I'm like, come on, this is a joke. Like, this, all those people are just did it because their friends are doing it. They're like, oh, 100 hundred dollar deposit yes yeah. i'm gonna and then it's like a batch of honor then they like oh let me tweet i just reserved my yeah well, and I, I mean honestly i wish they'd get their arms around production issues on the cars they have yeah i mean versus that's worrying so much about this other quirky thing but i i yeah. know i'm in the minority there <laughs> at least among the no Tesla folks. i i think it's a real issue like look i i have a car from them and it's perfect it doesn't have any issues that we've needed a fix or whatever but i realize that there are people get cars that are legitimate issues right and so if you if they had given me that run around that rich got or there's some, some other youtubers that took like two months to get theirs repaired from just a a simple they backed up into something and that right went oh on the body ordeal, shop right? issues or something else yeah yeah so I would feel different about Tesla, right? I don't have an axe to grind with them because I, I, they haven't put me through that. But I can kind of look and be like, well, if I was that dude, I'd feel different about them. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. People... and I don't have an axe to grind either, but I do feel very strongly that customer experience with EVs is really important to their success ultimately. Yeah. And there's yeah, some agree. amount that can be tolerated and sucked up in the spirit of an early program or this you know, underdog company I want to root for. And all of that is true yeah. and fair, but there's also going to be a point at which that diminishes. Yeah. And it we're has already there. happened for some. I and there are others there. that will that will last longer. But yeah, so those are the things that worry me more. Not, not because Tesla, just if people don't have a good experience with their EVs, especially those that are getting their first ones in the Model 3 and Y now that it's cheaper than the other ones were, yeah. I'm not going to come back. And the fact that it's a Tesla won't inherently change that unless Tesla makes that experience better. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. But you're still a hater. I don't know why you're such a hater. Uh, <laughs> I'm evil. And I'm you're in the evil. of oil companies. <laughs> That's right. You're taking a check. I have a Chevron refinery a block away from me. And man, <laughs> right. they deliver a bag of money on my doorstep. That's right. So let's, uh, how about the future? Where, where, what are your future endeavors? What are you doing? Uh, and where should we catch you on um, these days? Because obviously, like, your past is pretty exciting. You've done a lot of stuff. You've been there from the beginning. Um, I stir all the and, pots. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I am Evie Chels everywhere on Twitter, Evie, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on probably some bathroom wall somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I make occasional appearances on Fully Charged and Fully Charged. To, to crash podcasts like yours and, and things like that. I write an occasional article when something gets under my skin. And otherwise, I do a fair amount of advising and consulting and speaking and things like that. So, all in this yeah. world, but I wear many hats and Mostly yeah. just trying to drive all of these things forward. I'm the yeah. grout between the tiles. There and you I go. Nudge everybody in a better direction. <laughs> Not yeah, that's good. That's, you've said that before, right? I feel like that was that was uh, that you said that many times. Um, <laughs> like it was it was rehearsed. Um, will we see you at fully charged live this I year sure next year? Hope so. Oh, okay. I want to go too. I was it was a great event. I I love the. The fans, I love the people. It was the, wild. It's all yeah. a blur now because it was so nuts in the end. Um, but it was yeah. wonderful. And yeah. I got to road trip there with an EV1, which was like oh, the highlight right. of my year, especially given what happened the rest that's of the year. Right. Would you take an EV1 if you could? Would I take one? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, if only to save it from the crusher. But I've never sought one out for myself you never since have. the program ended. No. I, well, I mean, I was on my own waiting list when we were still selling cars, um, but I never. But you got never one got myself. one. Nope, never got one. Wow, um, you were not even an owner. You wow, you were. That was. Cool. I had. Tw I mean, at various points, I had twelve of them lined up in front of my house because I had between three and twelve demos at any given time. I see. And they only came in three colors, which was really fun for the neighbors. <laughs> oh, I. And I see. lived in an apartment, so I had no home charging. Oh, wow. So I used to distribute them in public chargers around my little town. I'd swap them out at least once a day. And there was a charger at our little city hall. And so every day I'd go and switch it out. And finally, the city called me up and they said, OK, we've looked up the license plate and we get we know this is your car, but you cannot leave it here for weeks. And I, told, I was like, oh, no, I, I, I swap it out every day. The problem is I have six green ones. 
Oh, it's different cars. <laughs> Look at the license plate. But well, they're manufacturer plates, so they all said 71 oh. on them. Oh, so the VIN numbers were different. But yeah, it was. It was oh, I had plenty cool. of time driving one. Is my point? Even oh, I, I didn't see. get to have one of my own. Oh, I see. Yeah. Uh, do you know uh, Oldmar Evan Evan Hart? Yeah. He, okay, so he. I remember I was up there in the shop once. And he showed me a, a crate. I was like, what are all these crates? And he's like, oh, let me show you. And he took out, and it's, a, it's one of those motors or whatever. And he's like, I go, what are you going to do with that thing? And he's like, oh, we'll find a car to put it on yeah. here or something. You know, it's like, <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's that would be interesting to put it in some car, you know. And Honda like, Insights are a popular choice for that, yes. Actually, Saturns Insights. have been very popular for conversions, too, because they're really? so light. Yeah, because yeah. they're plastic panels. and Because so, they're yeah, plastic. They're... Wow. I, I maybe I'll get into that one day, but I'm doing the the classic ones just because they're kind of iconic. Oh, those are f for sure. Yeah, absolutely. People, because I want to rent them, right? Because that's the other thing. People can't. It's too expensive to them. make these. Yeah. And so you can have a classic car, like everybody, like who's gonna rent you their classic car? Like that doesn't right. exist. You gotta be crazy to do that. Well, I'm crazy, so I guess I, I'm la I'm signing up to do that. So I'll <laughs> let you know when I'm done with that. Maybe we can. Yeah. Uh, have you I do a, a review in Hawaii or something? Whenever this whole pandemic <laughs> is done, and, and we can have rental business and the traveling and stuff, and uh, I think yeah, that must be done. Yes. Yes. Hopefully, 2021. It's the year, and not you know too much longer. <laughs> yes, we're hoping. Chelsea, thank you for coming and talking to me, and spending this much time. Thanks uh, for having me. It's talking about this stuff. Uh, yeah, we'll have you again uh, soon, okay? I look forward to it. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.